Welcome to Stitchery Stories, where textile artists share their life in fabric and thread. Inspiration, techniques, disasters and delights. And I'm Susan Weeks, enthusiastic embroiderer and textile arts dabbler who also loves podcasting. So take a break and enjoy our light-hearted chat and please share with your friends so they can enjoy it too. Hello and welcome today to our lovely guest, Natalie Dupuy. Hi, Natalie. Hi, Sue. It's lovely to talk with you today, Natalie. And Natalie is our first Canadian guest. And you're in Montreal, aren't you, Natalie, in Canada? Yep, buried under a layer of ice. (laughs) Our our ice went, but we don't have anywhere near as much as you do. No. (laughs) And I've got a lovely bio for Natalie. So Natalie Dupuy holds a master's degree in education and taught as a classroom teacher and a teacher trainer in Toronto, Paris and London, where she lived abroad for many years. After having children, she combined her love for teaching and her passion for embroidery and now teaches metalwork and surface embroidery at various locations in Montreal. She has trained part-time at the Royal School of Needlework in London and has enjoyed learning at national seminars. She's recently enjoyed accolades for her original design at the national level and has been invited to teach at Canada's annual embroidery seminar as well as for the San Francisco School of Needlework and Design. Oh, that's a mouthful, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, it is. Natalie's work features in Embroidery Canada magazine and she's got upcoming pieces in Australia's Inspirations magazine and the USA's Needle Arts magazine. Natalie is currently working on a master level program in metal thread embroidery and is writing a research paper on the gold work techniques of or new air versus Italian shading. Natalie has been awarded numerous embroidery education related grants, including the EGA's Research Fellowship Grant Award. She has two young children who inspire her to be creative and pass on the love of needle arts. And Natalie is involved in Waldorf education, which values nature, creativity, and of course, handwork of all sorts. Wow, there we are. That's very busy. (laughs) Being involved in lots of things, Natalie. Welcome. Thank you. I'm happy to be here today. Now then, so as we get started with your stitchery story today, would you like to share with us, Natalie, what you are working on and what has got you excited? Oh, yes. Uh, Today I get to pick up my latest piece from the framer. Um, I just created a a goldwork tree of life design inspired from an Art Nouveau mural done by Gustav Klimt. And I decided to use a cloth of gold, which is a very expensive fabric, but also beautiful. Mm -hmm. It's almost exclusively used in ecclesiastical embroidery. But because Gustav Klimt liked to use gold, I thought, why not use this idea of a tree of life? on cloth of gold um, and see how it stitches up and how it would reflect the light along with the the gold work techniques that I have on it. So that one I get to pick up today Mm. and I'm really excited to see how it looks all finished up because this is going to be a project that I I kit up for other people to try out which I think will be interesting for them as it has cloth of gold and most people don't want to buy this fabric by the yard yeah so in my design it's just a, a nice little piece and they can have their their taste and working on it so I'm I'm really excited to get that back yeah. and start collecting uh-huh. all the supplies yeah. and um, that's exciting because collecting supplies means I get to do shopping for gold work stuff in large quantities yes. and um, everybody likes to do that so. yes. I can say so that that'll be exciting picking that up today and I have yeah. noticed your various work in progress images on Instagram of your tree of life which reminds me your links so yes yeah, so you can find Natalie's images she keeps her Instagram up nicely to date so she's you are so by hand mtl uh, on Instagram and so by hand montreal on Facebook aren't you and then Natalie's website is so by hand.com. So of course, all of those links will be on Natalie's page on stitcherystories.com. So, but um, yeah, that tree of life is looking wonderful. Really, really nice. Well, it's, uh, extra fun about that is um, there's some metal threads in there, vintage from the 1920s um, mm. in France. I discovered a, a shop in San Francisco called Tinsel Trading, and they specialize in vintage metal threads. Ooh. And uh, it's, if you like gold work, it is 
like a treasure trove. <laughs> so um, I've been able to include some of those in the design. Yeah. Um, so it's quite fun to use the new metal, the old metal and cloth of gold all mixed together. Yeah. Wow. That's going to be very exciting. And, and as you say, mm-hmm. um, it, it's nice to be able to try things out with a small piece rather than thinking that you've got to buy, you know, a meter of it or, or whatever, just to have yeah. a, a small piece gives it, gives you the opportunity yeah. to try it, which I think is one of the fantastic things about working with a kit is it just gives yeah. you an opportunity to try something new in a in a in a guided guided way, isn't it? Yeah, and that's how I started out doing a lot of embroidery was through kits and getting to explore different threads. They're very useful. So I can see why you're all excited about that, definitely. And did you say you're working on some? So you've got that as a kit as well. And then I noticed there's quite a few other kits starting to grow on your website as well now. <laughs> yeah. I, I have other designs, which has been really exciting to go from a stitcher of other people's kits mm-hmm. to coming up with my own new designs and then packaging them up so that my future students have something unique to work on as well. Yeah. So I've got the ball rolling on that and um, I can't imagine where I'm going to be in 10 years with which designs are going to come up and what am I going to make and who can I inspire? So I don't think I'll be stitching anybody else's designs for a while. I just have to keep working on my own. <laughs> yeah, well, of course, that, that whole design process takes, you know, there's a lot of time and work goes into that, isn't there, to come up with the idea and then to work it with the view of it being a kit. I suppose there's a different, almost a different design process is there there. It is. If it was just a piece that I would be hanging on my wall, I, I would stitch it in a different way, perhaps use different materials, but thinking about, okay, how are my students going to access this? Can I get this in large quantities? It, it does uh, impact on how, how I approach what, what threads am I going to use and do I do this technique or not? Will it be too complicated for, for students? That being said, though, I don't, I only design something that I would like as well. Yeah. So I don't think, I don't design something like a, for example, a button butterfly or flower and say Mm. oh I'm going to make a butterfly or flower because it's going to appeal to people but it doesn't appeal to me so I I wouldn't do that yeah yeah so it has to be something that I I really love and would hang on my wall as well but I I design it perhaps a little bit differently so so where did you we might come on to this a bit later but I'm I'm going to ask you now because otherwise I'll forget so Mm. there's a picture that there's a design there of a snail and he's got all bits of uh, like a, a clock pieces of a watch all in him where, where did you get that idea from I think he looks absolutely fantastic that snail with the all the watch pieces on go, go and have a look on Instagram everyone if you don't know what I'm talking about <laughs> yeah he, he that cute little guy he, well I had before I stitched him I had stitched a dragonfly with yes. the same idea with watch parts in the wings and um, I was applying to teach at a, a national level seminar and I needed a one-day class mm-hmm. I thought right I already had a a three-day class submitted, a two-day and a four-day, but I didn't have a one-day design. Yeah, I just sat down and I'm like, wow, this steampunk idea, that's kind of fun. Yeah. What could I do? Nice, simple little little thing also with watch parts, still in the insect theme because I was into insects at the time. Mm. And um, the snail just popped in my head. I thought, right, I'm going to make a little snail and his, his shell will be filled with watch parts and I'll put a few simple techniques and ta-da, one-day class. Yeah. So sometimes it takes a long time to come up with an idea, but other times they just happen in my head quickly, which is mm. exciting, really exciting. Yeah, and and I particularly like that. Yeah, the, the steampunk thing is always always visually very pleasing, isn't it? But um, I yeah. think the the the, the, the brilliant idea behind that was it's a really good way of filling up the shell without actually having to do tons and tons of stitches. So I thought that was really sneaky as well and very very attractive. Yeah. Oh, my students, they love it. They can't wait to get to that step. They're like kids giggling and putting together a puzzle. And um, yeah, that's a fun one. Yeah, I really like that. And the, the last thing on kits as well is I've, I've taken the plunge and I've got Natalie's um, colour wheel. So again, go and have a look on Instagram. Or it'll be on Facebook as well, isn't it? She's this beautiful circle. It's like a rainbow. And it's the one I was speaking with Sarah Rakishaw from Golden Hind. That's it. Thank you. <laughs> Sarah from Golden Hind. And um, we were talking about, I was saying I've never really tried gold work. So we was to, when, and I'd seen your lovely colour wheel, which is just like a silver rainbow. It's beautiful in a circle. So I'm looking forward to really getting started with that. I'll be posting updates. When you get there, I'll be your coach. 
thank you. <laughs> Right. You mentioned there that you actually previously worked other people's kits and so forth. So how did you actually get interested in embroidery, Natalie? And how have you developed that starting point into into where you are now? Oh, right. That's a big question. <laughs> uh, I have I have an aunt named, named Lynn, who is a needle worker. Mm. And as a child growing up, I would visit her house and there'd be cross stitch and uh, petit point, needle point cruel work on her wall. She's always working on something creative. And at some point I went and lived with her and I thought, right, she's kind of my idol at that age and I'm going to do needlework as well. Mm. And there was a needlework shop walking distance from where she lived to the misfortune of my budget. <laughs> I went in and, and bought kits and threads and, and had a go and she showed me as, as best as she was able. So I still have some of those projects from my 17-year-old days, which are quite embarrassing to go look at, but I've decided I'm not going to throw them out. Oh, no, 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 you can't. Yeah, I wish I had more from, from that age, which I don't really, but never mind. So don't throw them away. <laughs> well, what's funny is I, I have those, but later on in life, once I, I decided I wanted to, to learn more, I decided I should go and take a class at the RSN. Mm. And uh, the first project I did with the RSN no longer exists. <laughs> <laughs> because I just after I became much more skilled I said right I do not want this evidence to show anywhere <laughs> and uh, the reason I decided to go and well I mean taking a professional class at, at that level is is pretty exciting but I decided to do that because I had once again purchased a kit that I, I didn't know what to do with it it was a technique that was new to me but it was so beautiful I just I wanted to to give it a go and then I realized that some coaching would be necessary. Right, brilliant. So so you must have been in London at the time then when you did the RSN. Yeah, I used to live in Richmond, actually, which is just a quick bus ride away from Hampton Court. Very convenient. Yeah. Oh, I wish I had taken advantage of my time there more. So then you you did your RSN. So then how did you you know move through into deciding that this was something you were going to spend more time on? Right. So... I'll just backtrack a little bit. I, as you said earlier, I have a master's degree in education and I, I've been a teacher for a long time. I really love teaching. And once I had children, I decided I didn't want to go back to teaching children. I thought maybe I might be too tired to come home to my own. Yeah. Okay. So I thought, right. I'll just start. I'm going to become an embroidery teacher. That, that makes sense to me. At first, it was just private lessons with my friends. And then I decided to try, put myself out there and approach um, kind of like a craft cafe and say, hey, I, I teach embroidery. Can I teach for you? And um, they said yes. And um, after attending some national level seminars and seeing those teachers, I was quite inspired by them. I said, right, I'm, I'm going to teach at that level. How, how do I do that? So I just kept teaching larger and larger groups and more and more complex projects and uh, trying some of my original designs on them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the crew in Montreal here have been really supportive. And then I decided that I was going to try and teach internationally, mm -hmm. find, find the right venue. England is hard to teach at when you're living in Canada. Yes. But there's lots of great places in the U.S. that you can apply to teach for been able to teach for the San Francisco School of Needlework and Design, which was really exciting for me last year to come down as their first international teacher. Fantastic. Onwards and upwards. Yeah, I really like that. You've taken a very determined step. I suppose each time pushing yourself out of your comfort zone to do yeah. so. Which includes doing a podcast <laughs> a bit out of my comfort zone. Here I am. <laughs> you know, one, you know, one little step at a time to, to the next next thing. Yeah. And, th and that's how we achieve anything, isn't it? And, and, it, and it can seem really daunting. And now you've, you've achieved those things and you're, you're developing your own kits and, and running your own business around something that you love. You're there for your children as well. So that's great, isn't it? Yeah. And you know, it also comes down to having confidence in yourself, having some drive and putting your energy into thinking, Wait, how am I going to do this? What is what are the steps that I'm going to take to get me to my goal? And, you know, of course, everybody has setbacks, but mm. you don't let it set you back too much. You just keep going. Yeah. You know, my children, they're a, a pretty big inspiration as well. They have constant setbacks as little kids, you know, always falling and hurting themselves. Or things aren't going the way they want. They just have this energy to keep going. So I, I take from that a little bit as well. Yeah, definitely. And what about a community of stitchers? You know, I obviously know a lot about the UK embroidery scene and obviously I'm part of the Embroiderers Guild as well. So the, for me, the community side of it and knowing that you've got other people who you can bounce ideas off, how, how do you do on that kind of thing? Yeah, it's been fantastic here in Canada. It's called the Embroidery Association of Canada. 
Right. And there are a, a few key people within the association that have helped me kind of get to my goal, coached me, encouraged me to submit designs and, and given me feedback on how, how to get to where I want to go. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, there's the smaller local guilds, yeah. which I think is similar to what's in the UK, where you can go for weekly or monthly support and just sharing yeah. your ideas. And you, you can kind of practice teaching ideas on them if they're you know, a small, very welcoming group before trying to go off to something bigger. Yeah. So that's been really valuable for me to, to be a part of that uh, and learn from these ladies with a lot of experience. I'm on this younger side compared to many of the, yeah. the women. Yeah. I can get a lot of uh, advice from them. They've been there. Yeah, that, that's brilliant. I, I was just wondering, as I say, because I, I, I know what the kind of structure is you know, here, but it, it was since you're our first Canadian guest, but I know we have lots of Canadian listeners. I was just quite intrigued as to, um, you know, what kind of level of support. So obviously the, the support, therefore, from that association has been inspiring for you as well, hasn't it, to help you? keep on moving yeah. forward yeah I think I I wouldn't be where I where I am today without the support of some of the key people in the Embroidery Association of Canada and they've also you know given me the chance and invited me to teach at their national seminar yeah it's been wonderful to have that support so I it would be a little bit lonely I think to not be part of a guild yeah I'm glad I'm it exists here and in many of the big cities there's there's local local guilds as well yeah, it, it is. It's that community aspect. And many of my guests come, come down to that. And as much as it's nice to be at home doing, you know, what we love, it's also really nice to be able to get out of the house and go and meet other people who love doing what yeah. you do. This is why I like being yeah. part of the, the embroidery Guild here. Because none of my, right. you know, none of my friends are, are interested in it. I'll have embroidery friends, if you know what I mean. So, it, you know, that's really, it, it's essential, I think, to be able to share your your hobby and your passion with, with other people. And then these are not my students either in the embroidery guild for the most part. They're, they're, they're my, they're my peers, my colleagues, yeah. whereas I've, you know, I, I have a group of students, but that's different. Yes. Yes. And there's kind of a, a student teacher barrier. Yes. It's a different relationship altogether, isn't it? Yeah. So in addition then, have you had any other major inspirations in your journey, Natalie? No, I'm, I think it's, it's watching other teachers in action and seeing good teaching happen. Mm. So that was really important to me because I, I've seen a lot of bad teaching, <laughs> meaning somebody, somebody is, a, is good at their embroidery technique, but they don't know anything about teaching, structuring a classroom, helping somebody who's struggling, managing the classroom when you get the difficult students. Yeah. So when I see, see that happening in a, in a good way, it inspires me to say, right, I'm going to become one of these these strong teachers that inspires the whole group and uh, and how do I do that and it, it brings me back to my background in education and pulling out the toolkit from there so I, I kind of think my background in education has helped me more so than my stitching skills because a strong teacher can kind of teach not anything but can teach many things well whereas somebody who's a you know a musician or or an embroiderer doesn't necessarily know how to, how to guide a group. Yeah. So that's been inspiring for me. Those those good teachers. Yeah, that's a really important point you bring out there, and and that goes across anything. You know, um, even in technology, I work in. You know, so many people are, are good at technology, but they cannot explain it. And ha- trying to explain programming or that kind of thing is is a skill in itself. So yeah, that's yeah. really good that you've brought out your previous professional career experience and now mixing it with the embroidery and then trying to push that forward one of the things that I liked about the setup that you have for the for the color wheel for example is using a a Facebook group to guide and help people so I think that's so important when you're doing it remotely isn't it it's a different level of skills teaching remotely than teaching face-to-face yeah having tact and um, getting back to people as soon as you can and just really being a professional I take take the teaching of something to a professional level yeah yeah oh that's brilliant now I think we probably know what your favorite techniques are but um, do you want to discuss through some of your favorite techniques for us Natalie and, and why do you like them so much so there's one main one and the second one that exists a little bit in the background so gold work is is my preferred technique I like I like the bling of it, the, yes. <laughs> the shiny, the tech, the, the textures, um, and the wow, kind of the wow factor that you get with it. The three dimension that you can add, the play of light. Yeah, and I can get into this later. But what I'm especially interested in gold work these days is that the threads tarnish. 
they change color, they, your piece evolves over time, it doesn't stay stagnant. Mm-hmm. So you kind of have this evolving work of art in your gold work pieces, and you can accelerate that if you want, you can slow it down. So gold work really, I think it's for me, it's I can't imagine ever getting tired of it. Yeah. <laughs> my, my pieces are, are going to continue to evolve over time. And, you know, and it's a challenge to work with. It's not, <laughs> they're not simple threads to work with. No, no. And then the other technique is Japanese embroidery. I've started to gain an interest in for, they have a metalwork element. Yeah. Um, but they also have beautiful silk threads. So I don't particularly like the, the design sense of Japanese embroidery, but I like the threads. So if right. you want to have access to the, their 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 flat silk threads and some of learning the the metalwork techniques in Japanese embroidery, they kind of need to learn learn it from the base. So those are the two areas I spend most of my time. Right. So is the uh, Japanese embroidery something that you're starting to do a bit more of? Well, I'm part of a group that meets once a month and they get together to do exclusively Japanese embroidery. Ah, right. And at first I joined the group just because I wanted to know about the metal thread aspect of Japanese embroidery. But I think yes. slowly, little by little, they're convincing me <laughs> to, <laughs> to um, appreciate just the, the beauty of the, the silk aspects of it as well. Yeah, it's so beautiful, aren't they? There's, there's, nothing, there's no other word you can describe. Yeah, it seems a, a good match to an interesting gold work embroidery and the precision that comes with that and Japanese embroidery they're kind of I put them in the same sphere yes yes they are technically hard to do well yes <laughs> exactly yes. lots of practice involved. that being said I mean there's I have some designs where I'm tr- I'm trying to be a little bit more on the messy side and a little bit more creative and do uneven spacing and leave some threads unfinished yeah, which is exciting as well. And for example, the snail, I use yeah. I use a cut work in a creative way, and I have this piece inspired by the Starry Night that has all these kind of wild tails hanging everywhere. So it's fun to to do a little bit of that stuff as well. Yeah, and I think that's where the creativity comes in, doesn't it? And the, again, getting out of your comfort zone. Right? How can I make this? You know, and all these things appeal to different people as well for different reasons, don't they? So I think it gives a good broad offering. And yes, the, the Starry Night piece. I, again, I know that I know the one. So I, so I've been stalking you on Instagram. You see, so <laughs> for ages. <laughs> that's lovely as well. So yeah, I think. There's, there's, there's so much beautiful work out there. I think kind of making something, you know, your own, putting your own creative stamp on it is is is, an, is another challenge as well. So, yeah, that's really lovely. Right. So what would you say then, Natalie, has been the high point of your textile art and embroidery journey so far? Because you've had a, a, a kind of a varied path to where you are now. Is there any particular highlights that you'd like to share with us? It's got to be the the time that I decided that I'm not going to work on other people's designs. I'm going to make my own and yeah. and starting to make them and get some recognition for them. Yeah, this is a, was a real confidence booster for me. That huh? I don't have a degree in design, and it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I can still I can still create something that that's interesting and lovely. So that was probably like a a one year window going from only being able to work other people's pieces to exploring my own and um, getting positive feedback on that. Wow, that was quite a quick path then, wasn't it, really, to to have moved so much in a year? Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Certainly, again, looking at your designs, they are very different and very creative. So I'm not surprised you were getting some good feedback, some accolades for them, because they are really, really good. But I think mentally, it's it's a big mental change to go from hobbyist to designer yes and when do you decide to call yourself a designer what what qualifies you as a designer at what point how many pieces do you have to do before you can say you're a designer (laughs) yeah and and you know I was was just going to ask you about that aspect because I think we all suffer from imposter syndrome don't we no matter how good we are at doing something very often we think to ourselves well who am I to call myself a this, that, and the other. Who am I to call myself an embroidery designer? Who am I to call myself a podcast? Yeah. Who am I? Yeah. Who am I? Who am I? And we're so terrible at, at belittling our achievements. And so I think it's lovely yeah. to be able to celebrate them. So that was obviously a really good celebratory point and a big aha for you to then change mm-hmm. in your, you know, the dialogue in your head and say, I am, yeah. I am this, this is what I am. And then you, yeah. then you own it, don't you? And it comes a bit self-fulfilling as well. You're like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm a designer. Huh. This is not so bad. I can do this. And 
and you kind of encourage yourself the more you put a label on yourself as well yeah that's it's that is really really true it's it's back to confidence it is isn't it it's very much a thing about yeah. self-confidence moving forward yeah. with some good support and we, we can achieve anything we want to when we get into that mood yeah now do you have any little stories sometimes we have a bit of a laugh about this when something was maybe a bit of a disaster but importantly Natalie what did you learn from that have you got anything you could share with us right so the um as we we're talking about my color wheel mm-hmm. I was really excited to to stitch it I thought this is going to be my, my masterpiece and I can't wait to showcase it at um the talk I was giving on gold work and so I, I I put a lot of hours blocks into it and I didn't rotate my frame as I was stitching you know every right. once in a while you should turn your frame around stitch from the other angle yeah and I didn't and I was nearly done I realized the center of my wheel has dropped down it's no longer at the center oh no so I had to learn a few creative because it was done in the technique of Italian shading which is like Ornuay but in a circle right I had to come well you don't want to undo it it takes a long time yeah so I had to uh, come up with a few clever ways to how can you shift the center of a circle so it is again in in your center so I did that it turned out very well in the end yeah yeah and um I've since stitched a second color wheel and I made sure I rotated my frame every couple rounds so that's a top tip then as well oh yeah definitely turn your frame rotate your frame as you work but also because I was working pretty intensely on it without mm. taking much breaks I developed a, a repetitive strain injury, which could you know, happen with any any <gasps> technique, any repetitive work. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. from that, I learned to take a break more often to really evaluate my posture. Do I have a chair back? Do I have my legs flat on the my feet flat on the floor? How's my lighting? How's my magnifier glass? Um, I had my glasses redone to make sure that I wasn't slouching so much over my work. Mm-hmm. And I learned to stitch two-handed so that I have a better balance of work between my, my right hand and my left hand. So it was a good learning experience for me, I would say, early, earlier on in my embroidery path to take care of my body so that I don't end up with a, an injury later, especially if I want to do this for 50 more years. Yeah. Now, this is something that rarely gets mentioned. And, well, I'm 54 and I find, you know, I've been working on keyboards all of my life. And for me... I have a very, very good office chair. I make sure everything's all adjusted correctly. I take breaks. I Mm -hmm. stare out the window, et cetera, et cetera. Because otherwise, I would finish up with, you know, so far, I'm I'm fine, really good, because I have Mm -hmm. taken care over years. But I know lots of people who have not uh, not been so lucky. So it can be really difficult. And, And I often wonder when I'm seeing, especially younger ladies, who are doing this professionally and are spending all the time embroidering, I do think to myself, crikey, your back must be killing you, your neck must be killing you, your, <laughs> your fingers must hurt. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah, so it's really good that you've raised this subject. So at least I hope everybody listening are going, oh, so shut up. But it's, it is, I'm really yeah. glad that you raised it. It's so important, isn't it, Natalie, to look after ourselves yeah, and I I asked around at some of the the students on at some of the bigger embroidery schools I said is there a module on 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 uh, on health health and safety for yourself when you're stitching so that this can become your career without it mm-hmm. becoming a, a repetitive strain injury and they say no oh. not right so if I ever run an embroidery school <laughs> which is not out of the question for yeah, me another go um I will definitely have something on, you know, get a physiotherapist to come in and give a, a lesson on ergonomics and just tips on posture. And I also had a very long visit with my optician to talk right. about how the eye works under magnification and uh, how you, you know, glasses, they sharpen, magnifiers make bigger. So it depends what you, what you're looking for. Yeah. So these are all interesting things to know about if you're going to become a nearly full-time stitcher. Yes, yes, definitely. Um, I mean, I've my eyesight's appalling. It always has been. So f- for me, I mean, I've got very focals, and but I do have the habit now of even then it's not quite close enough. Do you know what I mean? So I do find myself peering over the top of my glasses a lot, um, which is not right. good. That gives me a neck ache. So I said, right, mm-hmm. use your glasses properly. You can see through them perfectly fine. I've got a really nice portable bright light led light which i love mm-hmm. um, a, day, a natural daylight oh, light that makes such mm-hmm. a difference that really is i love that yeah it's it, i'm really really pleased that you brought that subject up natalie i would on the last point on that just you know think about the work you you've done to set up your workstation for your your computer yeah 
for your, your professional life and perhaps put the same energy into your, your uh, embroidery life as well. That is such a good point. Yes, yes. So there I am sat in the corner in the lounge, in the, you know, in the, the armchair, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. It's like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm really, I'm taking that lesson to heart now, Natalie. Thank you for saying that. It's really true. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, dear me. Now, some of the other things that I'm quite interested in about is basically how you organise your creative time again when you are doing this kind of full time you've also got the business aspects to cope with as well haven't you so you know how how do you go about just organizing your creative time keeping that creativity going um and and kind of running your business as well any kind of top tips for us there natalie Oof, that's a seriously hard question. <laughs> yeah, I have uh, I have two kids who just go to school in the morning. So right. I drop them off as quickly as I can, which is never quick because you have to pick up snowsuits and do endless cuddles and kisses to come back. And, and then you have to race home, tidy up the house, put on something in the slow cooker, and then try to <sighs> exhale and sit down and manage the business aspect of it. Look at pictures of of, of uh, what's happening in, on Instagram, trying to keep up with with what's happening yeah and then taking the time to to let yourself be inspired Mm. so this is not a lot of time in a day to make happen but um, I look at magazines I sometimes go to um, exhibitions fashion exhibitions yeah um, how how threads were used in an interesting way in designs and I read a lot of books Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot, I love to look at art books, like big coffee table books of, you know, Van Gogh and Gustav Klimt. And sometimes you just see something, it's in a, you know, it's painting, yeah. but you say, ha, ah, I wonder if I could use an aspect of this as, as a stitch. So I try to fit that in, in my little morning slot. And then when my kids have an afternoon nap and then when they go to bed at eight 30 at night, so <laughs> um, I have to steal p- pieces from here and there, but it all comes together in the end. And I think when you're determined, <laughs> you're going to find a way to, to, to make everything happen, including the, the computer side, the online side, as well as the stitching side, as well as finding inspiration. Just, you just do it. <laughs> you just learn to multitask. Yeah. And I think what you also learn is you learn to make the most of every little snippet of time that you do have. Um, and possibly not waste quite as much time you know we all think oh I need more time I need more time but what do you do with that more time usually just fritter it away on rubbish anyway so you know it's it's, I I always I always find myself if I've got loads of things to do you do actually get them done and when you've got nothing in particular you just turn around don't you and think well what have I done today I don't know really Well, they say that moms with young kids are the best, working moms with young kids are the best at multitasking because, you know, they just, there's a lot to get done and they they often find a way to make it happen. And I often will do things with my children. Like I got, for example, I got some gold work, uh, watercolor gold paint and I wanted to try them out. They had arrived in the mail, but my kids weren't going to bed for another eight hours. I said, right, we're doing family painting time. And, you know, and. All right. Here's how to how here's how to cut threads, and um, you know, I'm going to measure this long, and you're going to cut. So I'm able to find fun ways to involve them while still exploring or, or measuring things out as well, which is kind of fun. Yeah, and kids just love doing that sort of thing. I know when Ryan was younger, we was we was always doing things like that, and and even now with the technology side of things, he'll say to me, "Oh, mum, um, you know, so." I'll, Sometimes I'll show him like a new a new graphics tool or how to make some images or, you know, I think he's quite looking interested at in doing videos. He does animations and stuff. So it's nice, isn't it, to have something to share. They're learning something different and you're yeah. able to get on and do something as well. So, yeah, I thought yeah that, exactly. Doing, doing the painting, that was a good one, wasn't it? So they, they had their paints, yeah. no doubt, when you had your gold watercolors. Well, lucky them. I let them use a lot of the same materials that I have. So, Ooh. you know, they've got strands of overstretched pearl pearl and things twisted all tied around the, you know, the necks of their stuffies. Yeah. <laughs> so they'll be well versed in, in the embroidery supplies. <laughs> Fabulous. And I did see you shared some pictures of, um, it must have been your oldest daughter, helping to uh, go around and assemble kits. You did think you did a little oh, video. Yeah. So, yes, I thought that was brilliant. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> She's part of my assembly line. <laughs> well, she needs to be, doesn't she? Anything to help mummy. That's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Obviously, you've been very purposeful, Natalie, about 
what you've done and what you've achieved so far. So have you got any kind of particular future plans that you want to share with us, you know, coming up in 2019, uh, plans and projects that you'd just like to um, give us a bit of a glimmer as to uh, what you're oh, going yeah. to do to this year? So I've been given a research fellowship grant by the Embroider Guild of, Embroiderers Guild of America to write a report about the difference between Italian shading and Ornoué. Yeah. So I've done the research, I've done the photography, so now I need to sit and write about it and yeah. get that, that published. And through the yeah. same association, I applied for another grant to do some work on tarnished threads and how does our choice of cotton threads change if we know that the metal thread that's going to accompany it is going to tarnish over time? Would oh. we still choose bright red knowing that our copper thread is going to be black or you know um, the silver oh. thread will be this beautiful patina on it so I want to do some research more research on that and publish something I don't know what that's going to look like yet but something on that how fascinating though I'd ne- that would have never done well I don't know anything about metalwork and gold work but how fascinating yeah so, yeah it's been interacting with another substance wow absolutely I've had I've had some suffer in the house and to try <laughs> and tarnish my threads it's been really fun to experiment with tarnishing and seeing how your your threads change and and, and would this impact my ground fabric and, and these kinds of questions? Yeah. Yeah, maybe one day I'll run an embroidery school or run a satellite campus for an existing one. I don't know. We'll see. I've hopefully got 40 more years in me. <laughs> You've got plenty of time, that's for certain. Yeah. <laughs> Oh dear. Well, do you know, Nasty, it's been absolutely fantastic speaking to you. you you've come with some really interesting points. Um, I, I've, I've learned a lot as well. As I'd say, I don't really know very oh. much about gold work and so on. So, uh, just really, really fascinating. And really, I always admire people who go out with a plan and make steps and achieve goals. Um, and, I, and I don't care what the subject is, whether it's embroidery, yeah. technology, sport, it doesn't matter to me. It's that going out and putting yourself out there and pushing, you know, we have to push ourselves out of our comfort zones, don't we? So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. all credit to you, Natalie, for what you've achieved and in such a beautiful way. Oh, well, you know, I wanted to become part of something that was, that's beautiful and and help people and be, embroidery is such a beautiful world to be part of and create something lasting. Oh, it is. So here I go. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Here you go. Right. Well, that's just brilliant. Thank you so much, Natalie. I've thoroughly enjoyed speaking to you today. It's been an absolute pleasure. And um, yeah, so anybody in Canada can um, find find you easily enough. And um, you're over in San Francisco and all sorts of different places. So maybe we'll see you back in the UK at some point as well. I hope so. That's my plan. <laughs> right. It's been brilliant. Thank you, Natalie. Take care. Think about your posture. Bye. (laughs) If you liked this episode and want to hear more, then please join the Stitchery Stories fan club so you can get an email when a new episode is released. It's a quick and easy way of listening and of keeping up with any news and offers from our lovely guests. Please visit stitcherystories.com to join the fan club. Of course, if you have iTunes, then subscribe there to automatically get new episodes. And why not leave us a review and rating whilst you are there? So that is the end of our Stitchery story for today. So keep stitching, keep smiling, and keep creating your very own Stitchery stories. <laughs>